a landmark on the river, a former military base, also home to debates, celebrations, protests, and controversy. This is Parliament Hill. And for nearly 160 years, it has been the beating heart of our nation's government. Hello, I'm Ken Armstrong. The Canadian government functions in a three-branch system, the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. And today, we'll be focusing on the legislative branch, Canada's parliament, and within parliament, the Senate. Welcome to a Your TV special presentation, the Senate, Canada's sober second thought. It's an infinite threat in many respects to the planet, not to overblow that, but because it's also an, a huge, huge a source of economic opportunity. Uh, you know, we are in the civilization of fake news, but we're not in the oh. civilization of fake history. They're not buying it at the local bud store, they're buying it from the local bud dealer. So I think there needs to be a reality check. You know, that is wonderful. Can you imagine someone who came just 30 years ago as a senator today? A senator uh, and, and respecting the basic rules of this institution and it wasn't and needed to be dealt with we dealt with it in the most severe fashion possible and you know sometimes that is not the sober second thought thing to do it was Sir John A. Macdonald who coined the term in Canadian circles but the eighth president of the United States Martin Van Buren, who famously stated the government should not be guided by temporary excitement, but by sober second thought. This is one of the better ways to describe the purpose of the Canadian Upper House, also known as the Senate. Canada's 105 senators shape Canada's future. Senators scrutinize legislation. They suggest improvements and fix mistakes. And when the Senate speaks, the House of Commons listens. A bill must pass the Senate before it can become law. Created to counterbalance representation by population in the House of Commons, the Senate has evolved from defending regional interests to giving voice to underrepresented groups like Indigenous peoples, visible minorities and women. In recent memory, the mere mention of the Senate of Canada brings about thoughts of misspending, deception and scandal. And sadly, the rich heritage of this institution has been foreshadowed of late by the wrongdoings of a few. We sat down with six senators within these walls to find out more about the inner workings of the upper house. They each have their own unique backgrounds, agendas, and motivations, but they all share a hope for the betterment of our country. Well, Senator Leo Hazakis, I'm actually very pleased to be in your office here in the uh, parliamentary precinct. You are a former speaker of the uh, Senate and presently sitting representing the province of Quebec. Uh, and it's gone through some very, very difficult times in an, sort of an, from an image point of view. Uh, has that changed? in the last year or two? Look, Parliament always goes through difficult times. I mean, we're right in the arena of public life and we deal with difficult issues. And it's an institution that has served the country well for many, many years. But it's an institution that's really a mirror image of our society. You get the good, the bad, the ugly sometimes. Uh, no different than any other uh, place in Canada. The important thing for Canadians to understand is that whenever we've had challenges that we've had dealt with them head on. We didn't sweep anything under the rug. Uh, when we had in unfortunate moments where certain senators were misappropriating funds, we dealt with that you know, head on. We saw recently with a, a senator whose behavior was not becoming uh, and not fitting a senator uh, and, and respecting the basic rules of this institution and it wasn't and needed to be dealt with. We dealt with it in the most severe fashion possible. And actually our bar uh, for integrity uh, and ethics in the Senate, we feel is even higher than the code of law uh, in the country. Well, it's interesting too because part of that problem was not just yours, it's ours in the media where we have not perhaps explained your position and explained the role of the Senate as well as we could have. But as Speaker, you made a real effort to change that because you became uh, responsible for communications within the Senate uh, precinct. 
How would you do that? Absolutely. I think it, it's important that we respect the institutions that have helped make Canada the greatest country in the world. We're a bicameral system. The Westminster parliamentary system, I think, is the most valuable element that the British uh, have given this country. And I think it has served us well. And I think, quite frankly, we don't celebrate it enough. And we don't understand enough the contribution it has made. Uh, having said that, the Senate, like I said, like any institution, goes through its challenging moments. And we have as well. I'm proud of the fact that a couple of years ago, myself and a group of senators decided that we need to reform the way we communicate with the public. We do understand that communications is the tool to best create that element of accountability and transparency Canadians need so they can see what senators do for them. And as well, it serves us because it allows us to communicate with the people we serve. Communications and image control, part and parcel with politics at any level, but exponentially more important on a national stage like the Senate and recent controversies have made senators much more self-aware. The image of the Senate, uh, it, it has been battered to some extent. Yeah, it's it's had a difficult time in the last few years. Yeah. Um, and this addition, or at least the introduction of independent senators, mm -hmm. has come in now. Mm -hmm. uh, can you see a change in the Oh yeah, uh, there's no doubt about that. I mean, it has been a positive. I think it's positive, generally. I think it adds, of course, to the traditional government opposition, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, exchange of, you know, as Ideas, I said, of, yeah. you know, like a tennis court on one side to the other, as I described earlier yeah. on. I think it's important to have a group of independent. It doesn't mean, though, that among the Tory or the Liberal, there were no independent-minded senators. I mean, I can claim that I'm an independent-minded senator, and I have you know, I have voted against Mr. Mm -hmm. Trudeau's father when I was the other place. Mm -hmm. You will remember the Office of Languages Act and whatnot. I even sued Mr. Trudeau in court, as you know, yes. over the, you know, uh, the use of languages in the air traffic control yeah, and yeah. Uh, in Air Canada, you know, maintenance shop and whatnot. So, I mean, to be independent is essentially to exercise the best on your mind you know, in the evaluation and of the impact of the legislation. And if you come to the conclusion that that bill hurts a fundamental principle of the Charter, for instance, okay, we've paid for that, and that's our job. Yeah. I mean, the Canadians pays us to look into the legislation and make sure that their rights are respected yes. when, the, when Parliament enact legislation. And then the, the Canadians ask us you know, because we come from different regions, not constituencies, you know, within mm -hmm. sh small boundaries, but we come from a province, so from a region, uh, to, to be sure that the voice of smaller regions are heard, you know, in the debates. In other words, that the views of maritimes or smaller in population, you know, less gifted and resource rich, you know, western province, or cash rich in a financial institution like in Ontario, that those voices are heard. They expect that the uh, Nunavut territory and the, and the Northwest Territories, where lives only 60,000 Inuit, that those peoples who are, you know, a footnote in terms of population uh, ratio are heard because their preoccupation will condition our future because it's in their region that the resources, you know, lay for the future and where the climate change impact is the greatest. So in other words, the Senate is constructed to have that kind of minority views expressed. That's why Canadians have put us there. Yeah. So you, if you, in your own, you know, I should say, art and soul, come to the conclusion that the bill hurts, you know, the rights or the freedoms or the interests of the regions, you know, if you want to be able to look at yourself, you know, in the mirror in the morning when you shave, you say, I can't stand for that. Mm -hmm. And here's the reasons. And you have to explain them, though. I mean, you have to live up to, you know, uh, where you th your, your convictions lie. So in other words, to be independent is essentially a condition of mind. Well, let me ask you this then, Senator. Uh, you're a constitutional expert, and uh, this was conceived in 1867. Mm -hmm. There are four seats in PEI. There are 24 seats in, if I'm correct, 24 seats, I think, in Quebec. Yes, uh, 24, think, in Ontario, 24, 24 in Ontario. 24 in Ontario. West, yeah. Six in, in Newfoundland. In Newfoundland. Well, but Newfoundland, you have to understand, they joined Federation in 49. Uh, true, but you have British Columbia and yeah. Alberta yeah. both have six. Oh, yeah. Yes, of course. And, and because of the burgeoning population, yeah. you must have people out west saying, look, why don't we have greater representation? 
you you do rep by pop here in the other in place. The in the also so corner. do you not get the request to? Yes, there it? is no doubt. But you know we're not we're not insensitive to the fact that what we have to hear and listen to from British Columbia needs to pay much more attention from senators who come from British Columbia. Let me give you examples, you know, of Senator Larry Campbell, former mm -hmm. mayor of Vancouver, former coroner of, uh, you know, of Vancouver, and a very committed, you know, former RCMP officer. Uh, a senior Canadian, okay? A guy, if I can use that word, which is not really very respectful, but everybody will understand. You know, a guy with a long, uh, you know, uh, bio uh, realization uh, uh, sheet of, you know, of bio. credibility. Yeah. Yeah. So when he stands up and speaks, he, I would say he is listened more than if we would have. 12 senators from British Columbia because we know that he, they are not enough. And the same for Senator Jaffer, you know, a woman who is very active in, in, on, on abortional issues and on women's issues. Because when a region lacks representation, the normal, you know, I should say, the normal preoccupation of anyone is to be more attentive to the need expressed by senators. Mm -hmm. So you and me can hope that we would reopen the Constitution, you know, because it, we're easy at that. But on the other hand, the practicality of opening the Constitution those days is like uh, dreaming in fourth dimension. Yeah, yeah. Okay? So we have to do and act with the best of what, you know, the structure afford us now. Well, let me take back, let me go back just a few years when you were sitting in the, in the, uh, in the Senate. Nunavut was created. Yeah, 99, 1999. So at one time, there was a block of Senate, I would assume, there'd be a block of senators from the Northwest Territories? Yes, exactly. And how did you separate those two? Well, uh, it's Senator... Uh, to Nunavut. Yeah. It's Senator Chalawat was in Inuit, of course, uh, and Senator Adams, Willie Adams. I don't know if you remember, he retired a couple of years ago. Both of them were Inuit. Okay? And in those days, you know what we were doing in the Senate? We were trying to put together a Senate capacity for the Inuit to speak their language on the Senate floor. Oh, all right. Would you want me to repeat? Yeah. In yeah. Parliament of Canada, there would be Aboriginal languages being spoken by Aboriginal people, yeah. and especially by the Inuit, because their language is, is well structured, their language is spoken in various public institutions, and their community has a sense of you know, organization that is very strong. And we say when other senators coming from other aboriginal groups uh, would be there and they speak the language, we would try to manage to offer them the opportunity to do that. As mentioned earlier, each senator has their own hopes and motivations, but very few have the experiences of George Baker he was there the moment liberal senators became independent. For, for I've been in Parliament on Parliament Hill for 43 years, longest serving person on the Hill, and uh, 29 years as an elected member, and since that time as a senator. And during those 43 years, every morning, practically every morning, I read case law. I have access to two electronic forms of case law. And these are the these are the legal cases of our provincial courts, superior courts, Supreme Court of Canada, tribunals, quasi-judicial bodies. And I have analyzed it and found that the Senate is quoted seven times more than the House of Commons when you look at all of the tribunals and so on that, that operate in this country that keep our society together, seven times more. The reason for it is because the Senate is, of course, the last point at which legislation goes. And the Senate is where you would find the questioning on what laws mean. The House of Commons is a political institution filled with politics. 
and you never get to what does this mean what does that mean what do these laws mean so judges go back when they make their judgments and they go back to find out what was the intention of parliament and they find it in what happens in senate committees and so on so that's the real value whether senators realize it or not and i would say that perhaps maybe most of them don't realize that this great contribution is there and it's a necessity if you didn't have the senate i think you'd need some other body because well look what's happening right now we're doing an interview here now and i'm told because we're getting into june june of the, of of uh, this uh, particular year in june right now uh, the parliament of canada will pass bills and the motion will be deemed to have been read a second time, deemed to have been sent to committee, deemed to have been read a third time, and sent to the Senate for examination. Well, in grade five or grade six in the civics class, we learn that there's three stages of legislation, first reading, second reading, committee stage, third reading. Every, every child knows that. Well, that doesn't happen in June. It doesn't happen in December in the House of Commons. It's deemed to have been read. And so the function of the Senate becomes all the more important. That's why the Senate sits longer in the year. So the, the point being that when our tribunals, when our disciplinary committees for doctors or lawyers or nurses or the unions and so on examine what legislation means, what the, the human rights uh, tribunals mean, and so on, they invariably have to go back to the Senate because the Senate sits, takes the legislation and examines each piece of it. Now, the point is, if you go back to what the real purpose of the Senate is, yes, it's sober second thought, but in giving this meaning what Parliament intends for legislation, but there's a restriction you never go against the wishes of the people. In other words, the elected House of Commons, mm -hmm. you can't go defeating legislation in the House of Commons, but what you do is you examine it, you give it meaning, you perhaps amend it and send it back, as is happening now with the new Senate uh, makeup of independent members that the Prime Minister has decreed. And I congratulate him on that. I think it's an excellent idea. You were uh, a proponent of that uh, at, at, as soon as that was announced, you thought it would be the right, right way to yeah, go, yeah. and you've been proven right. Yes, but, uh, because you've taken out the partisanship of. Um, you're taking out Senate the partisanship. Right? Now, here is one way. You know, you look at the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau. I didn't really know him. I knew his father because I served under his father right, yeah, in, in his yeah. caucus. But, and I watched him. Uh, but one day he called all the senators together, liberal senators. Nobody knew what it was about. So all the senators were seated in the room, and in walks Justin Trudeau, and he had a piece of paper in his By hand. By himself. By himself. No researchers, no advisors, no nothing. Piece of paper. And he sat down in front of the senators, and don't forget now, a lot of these senators are famous liberal senators. They're fundraisers for the Liberal Party yeah, for yeah. years, worked mm -hmm. for the party, you know, former uh, politicians and so on, the Liberal Party. And the Prime Minister said, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here today to tell you that you are no longer a part of the Liberal Caucus. And there was a stunned silence? And there was a stunned silence. <laughs> and. Of course, I clapped. Yeah. I was the only one who clapped. But everybody was stunned, and they should be stunned. Yes. Now, I had been advocating this for years and never did uh, the, the, the other senators. Did you have I, a feeling this was I, coming? I, I, no. Nobody had a feeling this was coming. And he then explained it. He said, now, he said, there's a press release that I'm going to make, but I'll tell you what it is, and I'll leave it here. And he said, and then he explained it, why he was doing it. Now he said, I'm, I'm open to questions. There were no questions. No. I simply said, well, Prime Minister, I think this is a great move. Yeah. And uh, I congratulate you for your courage for coming here and doing it and doing it in this manner. 
Well, both and of you have been proven right, I think, I in think retrospect. So. I, I think so. The, yeah. the, you know, the, the, the Senate uh, is supposed to be sober second thought. It's not supposed to be sober political thought. Sober second thought is not political uh, thought in, mo in most instances. You know, when you belong to a caucus, in the Senate now you have the conservatives who belong to a caucus. And they go in once a week and they meet with their friends in the conservative caucus. And the position of the political party is outlined. And they are expected to carry that with them in the Senate. And, you know, sometimes that is not the sober second thought thing to do mm -hmm. to advocate those political positions. And that's what was wrong with having politics mm -hmm. in the Senate. Now, mind you, we always had a, we, you had the liberals and the conservatives. There were no NDPers, of course, because they never formed the government to appoint anybody. But you always had the leader of the government and the leader of the opposition, and there was a clash. And whenever you got to the point where the majority in the Senate was the minority in the House of Commons and the majority could defeat legislation, we'd always go behind closed doors and say, well, now we can't really defeat these bills, so let's be absent from our seats while this particular vote yes, comes yes, up yeah. in order to make the system work. How you hypocritical. Know, yeah. How hypocritical is right. But that's, that's the way the system worked and it was the only way it could work. Yeah. So by removing that, uh, uh, I, I think that we've we've uh, we've we've gone a long way, and uh, uh, you, you get to the point in the Senate where even the NDP, because the NDP always advocated the to demolish the Senate, it shouldn't be there. Well, I can tell you on two instances since I have been here, when the Senate has come to the Senate, when the NDP in the House of Commons have come to the senators and say, "Will you please stop this particular piece of legislation?" One was an income tax bill that they didn't read. It was 800 pages long. They skipped nine pages in the Commons. They didn't understand that they were giving a tax break to Americans and taking it away from yeah, Canadians. Yeah. You know, and so it was the NDP who came down the hall and said, "Look, uh, uh, Senator Baker, will you see if you can stop this bill?" And you know, and so on. And we did. What we did was, of course, we couldn't defeat the bill, but we just left it in committee because it was a bad bill and the NDP were correct. But where did the NDP go? They came to the Senate and said, look, you've got to stop this legislation. And sometimes we have been requested by uh, uh, MPs, and they've appeared before our committee saying, look, the House of Commons were wrong on this particular issue. And so that's how some of our amendments originate from actually from the House of Commons. So you can see the need of that sober second thought, because sometimes things pass the House of Commons late on a Friday afternoon when there's very few MPs present, or an agreement between political parties that they want a particular measure passed that really shouldn't be passed. So that's where the value of the Senate comes in. That has been a great step, uh, the appointment of independent senators. Yes. But it's a bit of a misnomer, isn't it, uh, Senator? Because uh, you are still appointed by the Prime Minister, or by the Governor General. By the Prime Minister? Uh, uh, I think yes. the Prime Minister. So, and then... so you do have some allegiance to the person that appoints you, do you not? I'm not sure I'd call it allegiance. Allegiance is a very strong word. Well, responsibility. I would not even call it responsibility. Yes, he appointed me. So yes, you are he touched truly me independent. on the shoulder. He said you and not someone else. Right. And mm -hmm. I think, mm -hmm. um, I believe, not I think, I know that he did this because there's a history of work behind me. Mm -hmm. And that history of work is important for our country, as, as is the history of work of other senators who are being appointed. There is absolutely no doubt that I have what I would call liberal social values. Uh, but politically, I would probably be left of the center, more left of mm -hmm. the center mm -hmm. than the party. Uh, but I, I have uh, no, uh, um, the prime minister has uh, no sticks and carrots. Uh, but, anymore, but the police is uh, the place mm -hmm. has become less partisan because of 
the independence of the last appointments, of the recent appointments? I think we are moving towards uh, a sort of a Senate renewal mm -hmm. that sees us uh, debate the merits of legislation from all points of view. There is, I think, possibly a greater diversity of perspectives now uh, because many of us do not come uh, from a background in political life. We come from a background in, I would say, social activism. Um, and there's a learning for us because you, when you're a social act activist, as I was, uh, you see the world and you see the changes you want to make uh, in the absolute in perfection. And then you realize when you become a legislator uh, that there's that there's a difference uh, in, in uh, moving things forward in terms of what is politically possible or, or realistic. Senator, you uh, have an, had an interesting career and still are, but uh, you served on environment uh, and you served in energy. Uh, are they compatible? It's a very interesting question because at one point I uh, raised, when I was a relatively new senator, I raised with um, uh, a, more, a, a veteran, Tommy Banks, wonderful uh, yes, I remember musician, that one of yeah, the greatest yeah. jazz musicians in yeah. Canada's history, and an outstandingly good senator, brilliant. And I said, well, you know, wouldn't it exactly? Isn't there some sort of a conflict? Shouldn't we separate? He said, no, absolute, absolutely not, because those two issues are so intertwined. Uh, you can't have uh, an economy with energy without energy, and you can't have an economy without the environment and without blending those two. And I think in, in many ways, the Senate Energy and Environment Committee has distinguished itself in its efforts to do that. Well, you have particular experience coming from Alberta, too, because of the oil sands. Yes, and I'm, uh, I'm one of my key issues, core issues, has been uh, climate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, to say that as an Albertan sounds somewhat provocative, but my belief is that um, uh, we do have climate change, and we have to be very, very serious about that, and uh, we need to blend a new economy and build to a new, a new economy in the way uh, without damaging Alberta's economy and its contribution to the to the uh, to the country and that's that's exactly the kind of work that the Senate does and that's where we we try to find often how do we represent regional interests and their contributions to the rest of the country with a national interest and it's um, and because we are uh, people who come from across the country because we have an official uh, responsibility to rec represent regional interests and minority interests, but because we're also a national body, that becomes a very, very important feature and a very uh, challenging feature of what we do. You've been here now for five years. Have you seen any? I know you've made a difference uh, because you're on record as being a reformist. Um, have you seen that reform come through? Are you pleased with it? Yeah, look, I. Satisfied with it? First of all, it takes 150 years to build it. It won't be fixed in five. Yeah, uh, yeah, good a, point. As an Aboriginal elder once told me, if it takes two days to walk in the woods, you know how long it takes to walk out. Yeah. So it won't be quick. Uh, but I do think we're in a better space today. Um, I think many of the things that need to be maintained are an opposition to a government, I think is important from a challenge function. That's a job. I used to say the Crown Prosecutor's job wasn't only to prosecute a case, it was to challenge the police to make sure the case was done properly. So I think the importance of the opposition needs to be seen as a challenge function, regardless of who's in power. So I think maintaining that will be key, I think, as we go through some of the reforms. I'm very pleased with the fact that in the last uh, year and a half that we have, I believe, made legislation much better than when it arrived on a number of occasions. And one is the opioid uh, bill that came here after yes. one day of hearings, one witness in the House. We had weeks of hearings under Bob Runciman, mean, you may remember the yes. former uh, Solicitor General from yeah. Ontario. Uh, weeks of witnesses who gave us great advice and we made a number of amendments who, that were for the most part accepted by the Government of Canada to, I think, make that legislation a better piece of legislation. Same as this uh, doctor assisted dying bill. So I do think um, we've seen some positive changes. Uh, I think the next two years will be our most important and crucial as to what the Senate can become. Uh, as for um, people who um, behaved in manners that weren't appreciated nor appropriate, and I'll use our most recent one, uh, former Senator uh, Meredith, and I'm, to be blunt, very pleased to say he's a former Senator. He did not deserve to represent Canadians mm -hmm. in the Senate based on his behavior. Yeah. And look, in policing, I used to say it all the time, you might be a good person and you might be good for many things. You're not good enough to wear this uniform anymore because of your behavior. 
you need to move on, that's life. Yeah. So I think we need to mean, I think that was a test for us that I think we passed. Now it's maintaining that level because I think the public's expectation should be that we're not behaving or acting in as, uh, at a, as good a level as they are or expect, but actually a better level. And if not, then people need to be replaced. That's well, like, you know, one of the best uh, partnerships that I've seen come across the floor is the uh, doctor-assisted uh, suicide. Yeah. Uh, and I thought that moved very effectively and very efficiently. And spectacular hearings, yeah, yeah. both before uh, the yeah. debate was... Yeah. Uh, uh, the best debate I've seen since I've been in the Senate, yeah. I have to say, fulsome. Um, you know, people were, cha I was challenged by this. I, yeah. I, you know, I, I can't help but make it personal when it's something like this. And I would walk through the legislation, how my mom would have imp been impacted. Yeah. And I know that she probably would have wanted to use that at one point in her life, but uh, mentally wouldn't have been able to. And is there some other way, you know, could, could they assign something ahead of time? So those discussions, I think, were very helpful to a fulsome piece of legislation that I still believe will be changed, by the way. I, I still think the Supreme Court of Canada will come back and, and widen the accessible accessibility when it comes to uh, our doctor assisted, medically assisted suicide. Up next on the Senate, Canada's sober second thought. And I think the element of theater and the super partisanship that exists in the House of Commons will not spill over to the Senate for one simple reason, the fact that we are not an elected body. And I think that was done intentionally by the forefathers in order to give it that unique, different dimension. Much like buildings, modernization of Senate is as much a necessity as it is a priority as Canada continues to mature as a country. In this half of the show, we'll continue our discussions about the Senate's direction and betterment. At least in the era of senators when I was appointed, Senator Denise Batters from Saskatchewan, also if I'm not mistaken, came in uh, pretty much somewhere around the 40 uh, mark as well. And the termination date is 75. That's what it is, yeah, the expiration date I call the it. expiration yeah. date. That's right. Are there many crowding that date at the present time? Uh, there are a few, there's always a few. Unfortunately, time ticks on and uh, people get uh, slowly to that, that, to that number, so. Now tell me about the difference between you as speaker in the Red Chamber. Uh, did you handle that, uh, that uh, chair differently than the chair or the speaker in the House of Commons? Well, the, 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 the objectives are the same. Of course, in the House of Commons, they have more specific rules, and the Speaker of the House of Commons is more of a referee, where the Speaker of the Senate is more really a barometer for consensus. Uh, in the Senate, more so than the House, the, the House determines ultimately the direction it takes. Uh, so it's a little bit of a different role. There's also a, a more diplomatic role for the Speaker of the Senate uh, in terms of uh, diplomacy and decorum. The Speaker, people don't know this, but the Speaker of the Senate is uh, fourth in line in terms of protocol in the country. There's the Governor General that's number one, the Prime Minister number two, the Supreme Court Justice number three, uh, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and number four is the Speaker of the Senate. Uh, and then it's the Speaker of the House of Commons. So a lot of diplomatic missions, head of states, uh, official visits, the Senate Speaker will, will, will be the person responsible for um, receiving those diplomatic missions. Now the Supreme Court is off-site, of course, but right in this parliamentary precinct. You have the House of Commons, you have the Red Chamber, and you also have, under the one roof, the, the vice regal position. So um, that type of bicameral uh, role, is it? Does it still work? Absolutely, and I think it's uh, essential in any democracy. Uh, and I think we are in a unique situation where we have one house that's elected, which is the supreme democratic authority of the country, and we have a second house, which is supposed to serve a sober second thought, take itself out of the pressure cooker of public opinion and some of the political uh, theater that goes on over in the House of Commons, which is inevitable because you're dealing with, with public electoral um, situation. Uh, so I, I think it's essential. I think you need to have those two chambers. In our system, because one is not elected, we have a little bit of a different role, uh, but I think one complements the other. Furthermore, we also have to appreciate that the Senate also represents minorities, represents inter uh, regional interests. And every time you have a general election, the outcome doesn't necessarily in the House of Commons represent uh, the views of every single region of the country. This is a vast country. 
with uh, cultural differences, linguistic differences. And there's a reason why the forefathers very thoughtfully put together the parliament that we have, obviously modeled after the Westminster system, modeled after the House of Commons in Great Britain, and of course the House of Lords. We're a hybrid, of course, of that. And I think it has served us very well. Now, it's incumbent upon us as parliamentarians, of course, in this era where communications is so fluid and people are fighting for, for the attention of people's minds. I think it's incumbent upon us to, to work harder than ever to explain to the public that our democracy is worth fighting for, is worth protecting, and the, ro the fundamental role it plays in keeping the executive in check and representing the interests of all Canadians. Well, there's nothing like the volatility of a House of Commons question period. And part of that, I suppose, is spearheaded or prompted by the uh, use of television, which you have not had. Mm -hmm. And uh, you don't have a huge spectator gallery uh, in the Red Chamber. But uh, as you move into the 21st century, I understand that you're going to bring in television. We are. A number of the administrative uh, reforms that we put forward over the last couple of years, that's one of, I think, the most important ones, to be honest with you, when we move into the new uh, government center. Because as you know, the center block will be closing down for renovation, and the august, beautiful Senate, as we know it today, will be closing down for a decade to go under renovation. We're moving into a new temporary Senate. Uh, and there's a decision that has been taken by the Senate chamber to broadcast Senate proceedings as of 2018. So do you anticipate any problems at that time with the addition of TV? I really don't think so. I believe that it will be only a positive outcome. I think Canadians will see firsthand the fine work that Canadian senators do on their behalf. And I think the element of theatre and the super partisanship that exists in the House of Commons will not spill over to the Senate for one simple reason the fact that we are not an elected body. And I think that was done intentionally by the forefathers in order to give it that unique, different dimension in terms of the debates we have. You're known as an individual uh, at the forefront of modernization for the Red Chamber. I like that term, the Red Chamber. Um, when you first came in, uh, you must have detected, or you must have been told, uh, there are a number of, of deficiencies in the system that should be changed. Uh, what might have been one or two of those deficiencies at the time that you arrived? I think the biggest deficiency uh, is the way we were communicating or not communicating with the public. The way communications has changed over the last decade and a yeah, half, yeah. Uh, the way the media has changed, the way the flow of information has changed, I think the institution hadn't changed accordingly. And we felt trapped to that because, of course, we were not an elected body and there was an assumption that we didn't have to communicate as much as our colleagues on the House, hide, uh, on the House of Commons side do. Uh, I think that has been the biggest transformation. Also, the fact that more than ever before, all of us have embraced the need to be more accountable. So when we're publicly disclosing now every single piece of expense on a line item basis, every single contract, there wasn't a compelling need to do that years ago. Now I think we all feel an obligation to do that. The fact that we're, uh, we're holding open public internal economy meetings, the fact that we're going to be broadcasting the Chamber of a Whole, these are historic changes for an institution that hadn't changed much in 150 years. There also wasn't a need to change that much because it has worked pretty well. And I keep reminding Canadians, there's a reason why we have the greatest country in the world. It's because our institutions have served us well. Are they perfect? No, they're not. And as long as we that are serving those inst institutions understand the need to continuously improve, and now the new buzzword is modernize, then I think we will continue to strengthen as a society and go forward and Canada will be healthier and stronger than ever before. Now you're interesting, it's interesting that you are now nearing the end of your career after a wonderful career of what, 43 years you yes, say? 43 years. Yeah. 43 years and a lot of memories, a lot of yeah. legislation has gone through. Oh, yeah. A lot of fights yep. uh, and a lot of electioneering when you were yep. the, running for the House itself. Are you leaving it in a better place for the 21st century? Well, that's, um, I suppose that's always debatable. You know, time goes on. Is it? Because you my know, perception is that it is a better place. Yeah, it is a better place. We need to, you know, my uh, chief interest has always been the justice system. We need to, uh, and our committee, for a legal committee that I'm a part of, are examining court delays and so on. So the question comes up, you know, uh, stays of proceedings, 
people who are charged with first degree murder uh, uh, having their entire case thrown out because it took too long in the courts. Mm -hmm. I think these are things that we should be reconsidering as a society in today's uh, uh, Supreme Court of Canada recently passed a, ca a case called Jordan and Williamson in which children were sexually assaulted in that case over a period of time mm -hmm. and the person was convicted was convicted by a jury trial mm -hmm. and yet the case went to the Supreme Court of Canada on that it took too long and now the entire thing is erased. Well, you know, th th there are some things, we have a great justice system, but it needs some correcting. And so I think whereas we made great progress, there's no doubt about it. I mean, our, our, our legislation, our social action, yeah. you know, has made this country the greatest country in the world. We have the best justice system in the world, but it needs some tweaking. Eh? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Vern White has one of the better understandings of the Canadian justice system amongst the 105 sitting senators. And having a long and diverse background in law enforcement, he uses his experience and knowledge to weigh in on Senate decisions. I never know what to call you. Do I call you Mr. White? Do I call you Constable White? No, I'm from Cape Inspector Breton. Inspector White? Call me Vern. Vern. Well, <laughs> Vern from Cape Breton. You, you've had so many accomplishments in the past. Uh, what's the future hold for you? I don't know. You know, I think there's still lots of opportunities out there. I, um, I, you know, I do other things other than sitting in the Senate. I do some work for a think tank in Australia around law enforcement and policing, and I teach at a university in Australia, but I do work here, so I, there's always educational opportunities, I think. Uh, I'm, the, the Senate work in particular and the committees, I have a, a lot of respect for, and I think there's a value to those in particular. Um, when it comes to the work comes out of those committees. Uh, but there's also opportunities, I think, operationally, you know, back out in policing that um, I may pursue. We'll see what happens. Well, you've referenced that police service, service for some time, and, uh, or at least on a number of occasions. Um, uh, it must be of great value to the Senate to have you as a spokesperson on some of these issues, uh, particularly Bill C-37, which is not the libera liberalization of marijuana, but per perhaps the uh, uh, allowing uh, younger people to have access to it legitimately. What do you think of that? Yeah, you know, the marijuana bill, uh, uh, I'm a realist. I want a party runs on a platform of doing one specific thing or one of a couple uh, that they're probably going to try to deliver on it. So I'm a realist. You win an election, majority on legalization of marijuana, then there's a real good chance to do that. They put together a really good um, team that uh, task force that looked at the legalization of marijuana uh, and came up with recommendations, some of which I agree with, some I haven't challenged by. I'm challenged by 18. I think it should be as the uh, I think Canadian uh, Medical Association yes, and, yes. and uh, as, as I would say psychiatrists yes. everywhere would argue it should be older. Uh, so that's a discussion we'll have in the Senate about whether or not it should be 19 or 20 or even 21, I think is what most, most medical professionals will talk about. There's also research coming out of both Colorado and Washington, done by the University of Washington, should be out in the next few weeks, that talks about the impact legalization has had on those two states in the U.S., which will be as close to our model as we're probably going to see. Unlike Amsterdam and others, it's as close to the model we all, that's being proposed here in legislation. Uh, so there are some areas I'm concerned by it, um, and some realities I also have. I, I, I guess the biggest concerns I have will be impaired driving. Uh, we have done some pilot projects around uh, saliva testing, um, and whether or not that should be five nanograms. Uh, my argument is if you have any in your system, you should be driving, because <clears throat> unlike alcohol, it's not as easy to figure out the impact of uh, marijuana as it is alcohol. Uh, edibles, I don't agree with edibles being legalized. <clears throat> I think it's too easy, first of all, to propagate towards young people if you have edibles, gummy bears, cookies, brownies. But that's exactly what's going to happen. No, I know it is. And that's what we're seeing, in fact, as uh, if you're seeing in Amsterdam, yeah, yeah. but as well, police officials in, in, uh, in uh, Colorado are saying that's one of their biggest challenges right now, that you know somebody on a work site mm -hmm. driving heavy mm -hmm. equipment with a bag of gummy bears in his pocket, mm -hmm. nobody even notices. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you had a bottle of beer, they'd pull them out of the truck, right? So I think edibles are a concern of mine. Uh, I think the last piece will be around the age. Um, and I think on top of all that, we need an umbrella of a national drug strategy that focuses on what uh, we said it would in the beginning when we started this, which was education, 
prevention and keeping young people away from drugs. And I don't think our national drug strategy uh, does that right now. Well, you mentioned the CMA, the Canadian uh, Medical Association, yeah. have been very strong, very strong opponents of taking it down to the age of 18. They say 25. Yeah. Uh, are, the, are the people designing the bill not listening? I, um, or do they throw it out and then? Well, I, I do think it's been tossed out, and, and uh, they expect changes. I don't, you know, almost every government bill that's come to the Senate has left with changes. So I think that it is tossed out and expecting changes. I don't know that they will accept 25. I'm hoping that they will accept uh, 21, uh, from my perspective. And uh, unlike most times when people talk about this, we there is not not enough evidence. There is a, a lot of evidence that supports. Uh, higher age than 18, and there's no evidence that supports 18. In, in reality, uh, the opposite is true. In fact, most provinces, you can't drink alcohol at 18. So I do think we need to have a bit of a reset when it comes to age, and, and I, I think we have to have a real clear plan on workplace safety in relation to edibles. I don't support edibles at all. My perspective is don't sell edibles. We don't sell uh, um, jelly shot uh, vodkas at the local liquor store for a reason because people will be doing jelly shots uh, you know wherever yeah, they wish yeah. I think there's a reason we don't do some of those things uh, and I hope it doesn't become about taxes because uh, money alone won't solve some of these problems I know some of the early research out of uh, University of Washington talks about the fact that domestic violence cases among marijuana users is actually increasing which yeah. we've never had research on that before because it's typically the marijuana use, first of all, isn't, either isn't reported, the domestic violence, uh, but more importantly, it's not as consistent. Yeah, yeah. If you have continuous access, more and more people are using their money to buy marijuana than they probably would have when it was an illegal purchase. What are you hearing from police authorities in the United States uh, well, who, are, who are dead against it? The, the concerns they're raising are similar to mine, impaired driving in particular, uh, edibles, age. Um, they're also talking about the fact that uh, a lot of young people are using. Uh, I don't know if it's more, but it's more obvious, at least, uh, that more people are, uh, are accessing it. I think uh, um, the price, if, you know, if we, if we turn this into a tax grab, uh, organized crime will continue to be the dominant salesperson when it comes to marijuana. So if we're selling marijuana at 14 or $15 a gram and organized crime is selling with the same tetrahydrocannabinol at 7 8% for $8 a gram, they're not buying it at the local yeah, bud yeah. store. They're buying it from the local bud dealer. So I think there needs to be a reality check about whether there really is a huge cash incentive when it comes to um, legalizing marijuana. So I think, there's, look, there's more questions than answers today, which I expected. Uh, hopefully that when the answers come, people will listen. Senator Grant Mitchell represents Alberta as an independent senator. He's had careers in the public service, business and politics and was called to the Senate in 2005. Since his appointment to the Senate, Mitchell has served on a number of Senate committees dedicated to undertaking research and hearing from witnesses on important issues affecting Canadians. I think there's so much momentum to fixing climate change, not just because it's, it's an infinite threat in mm. many respects to the planet, not to overblow that, but because it's also an, a huge, huge a source of economic opportunity. Whether or not Mr. Trump or others believe that climate change is occurring or that we're causing it, the fact of the matter is the world is beginning to believe that fundamentally. And I believe that just, just as uh, we were talking about the Second World War, just as the Second World War restructured Western industrialized economies, they didn't wreck Western industrialized economies, they created economies that have sustained uh, the, the, this nation and others at levels of, of quality of living that we could hardly imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, the next phase, the new economy, the economy of the 21st century, I think will be catalyzed by dealing with climate change and attacking climate change. It's not to say to do away with the oil sands or, or, or to, uh, to un, not, you know, to disregard the impact and the jobs and the lives of, of people across this country, not just in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Um, and, the, and what that means to them. But it is to say that, that we have to keep evolving and we have to keep meeting new markets and we have to keep thinking about where our children and grandchildren are going to be and what is the 21st century economy. I think we found the catalyst for it. It's interesting, Senator, uh, through our lives we've seen climate change. Absolutely. We? As I say to people, if, if you don't believe in climate change, just walk outside. Yeah, exactly. Now listen, you were on uh, national security too and you had the opportunity of going to Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. 
you were there for a period of time, which your eyes were opened, I'm sure. Yes. But particularly to the quality of Canadian soldiers. Oh. That that was in politics and political life. There are there are highs and there are lows. Um, that was one of the most powerful experiences I've had in what's now becoming quite a long political public policy career. Just getting off the the plane and in Kandahar and meeting the the women and the men in the military and seeing the quality and the and the commitment and the courage uh, and the commitment to the people you know there's a I have often said because my father was a, a soldier that you know great soldiers are actually uh, gentle people in in many respects with a with a hard edge when they need it and to see that uh, I will never forget it um, and then to go out with the military and we went out into the field and we went out into um, uh, places where there had been battles and to talk to the, the soldiers and and the and the other military personnel who had been involved in that was a very powerful experience this is a high quality of people who who gave everything they had to an, another nation and the people of that nation um, it was moving and powerful. Well, the Canadian Forces have spent 12 years in that theater. Have they made a difference? Uh, absolutely made a huge difference. Uh, I, I was saying to, to, to um, some people that I was giving to church, I love, I love these institutions. And in Canada, we are, I was really struck by this when I was in Afghanistan. We take some of our institutions for granted. This isn't just a building that we're sitting in. This is a symbol of everything we are as Canadians. And it's, and it's a mainstay, it's a basis, it's a foundation for our continued democracy. It, it, it bolsters it and advances it. You go to Afghanistan, there's none of that. Mm -hmm. there, there aren't virtual traditions of democracy, by and large, and there aren't any physical uh, structures that underline it. But what they did see was, was a military, a Canadian military from a very, very democratic, open, just society. Everything's being refurbished around here, it isn't is. it? Yes, it certainly is. And you're going to be moved out soon. You're going to be moved over to the old railway station, or at least the Senate will. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's quite a quite a job. They're completely redoing Parliament Hill, moving people around, and uh, this is going to go on for the next decade. In accordance with the long-term vision and plan, once rehabilitated, the Government Conference Center will accommodate the Senate for the duration of the Senate block rehabilitation. Rehabilitation work began in 2015, and building occupancy is planned for the opening session of Parliament in the fall of 2018. The building is a good fit for the Senate. It's close to Parliament Hill, and it has a variety of column-free spaces that will adapt well to Senate use. Its high ceilings allow it to accommodate the interim Senate chamber. It will also house the Senate legislative and leadership functions, three committee rooms, and support spaces. Since there is not sufficient space within the Government Conference Center to fit all the Senate functions being vacated, space in proximity to the East Block has been leased to accommodate the full complement of functions currently housed in the Senate Block. And it seems to be falling into place, doesn't it? It seems to be falling. I know it's, it's um, frustrating for you having to go through yes. that. But let me tell you, let me ask you a little bit about yourself because you bring a great deal of credibility to, to the seat that you hold now. Order of Ontario, uh, Order of Canada, a professor from Ryerson, a writer, a scholar. Uh, what else is there that uh, you can throw into the mix? But uh, I'm sure that people must look in awe at your daily activities. Uh, I, I don't know about the awe. I get a lot of uh, correspondence from constituents yeah, yeah. Who, who are either happy with the bill or unhappy with the bill. And when they're unhappy, they let, they let me know. Uh, and some of it can get uh, angry, to put a mild word to it. So I, I see Canada in full. And I think uh, this is a real privilege. Uh, because when you're an activist, when you're an academic, when you're a writer, there is something a little particular about those spaces in that you most of the time speak to people who think like you. Now it's interesting too because you're going to move your place of meeting, your meeting place, mm -hmm. over to the old railway building. Yes. So you're going to have a new opportunity, a new face 
Um, but it, no, I hope hope you don't bring old habits. That'll be a new start. Uh, I hope I I think our habits by and large are not bad habits. I'm really impressed. I want to tell uh, the people of Canada that the senators who work on their behalf are uniformly, whether I agree with them or disagree with them, I cannot disagree with my admiration for the hard work that they put in. Each one of them. Their days are terrible. Uh, I crawl into bed sometimes at 9.30 and kip over from exhaustion, not just from the physical effort of, of the work, but the mental effort of understanding and, and working on Canada yeah, in sure. full. One minute you're dealing with motor vehicle emissions, you have to know something about them mm -hmm. because you're going to vote. The next you're dealing on corporate directorship and then you're dealing with citizenship. It is completely invigorating and exhausting at the same time. The Senate is continuing to introduce new policies and is currently conducting a full review of the Senate administrative rules and also considering further oversight measures to ensure it is relevant, effective and accountable. There are ways to be involved for the public. Senate committee activities are detailed online along with a schedule of all meetings which can be viewed via live webcast or watched as archived video on CPAC. From Parliament Hill in the nation's capital, I'm Ken Armstrong. Thanks for watching the Senate, Canada's sober second thought. Bye-bye for now.